So we're going to jump to the book of Numbers because as we get to the end of Exodus, the story doesn't end. It keeps on. And uh, uh, so really the, the second half of the book of Numbers picks up uh, the story that goes through Exodus. Um, a lot of times people are confused about really what's going on chronologically. I think maybe even if you've just been with us through all these studies, you might be a little confused about the, the movement of God's people and the chronology that's going on. The whole second half of the book of Exodus and then on into the first, you know, about 15 chapters of Numbers, the children of Israel are still in, in immediate proximity to uh, Mount Sinai. They haven't gotten very far. So although it seems like for chapter after chapter after chapter, there's been all these things going on, but they're not moving very far. They're still in the shadows of Sinai. And uh, so geographically, what you have to understand is, you know, if you, you uh, they're not far from the promised land right now where we're talking about tonight. Spiritually, they're a million miles away, but geographically, it's right there. They just don't know it yet. And God is instructing and He's teaching. So we'll see. Again, let's uh, begin tonight by just thinking about a few things that we've learned so far about how the world sees Christianity as a set of regulations that only brings oppression. You know, people, and, and understandably so, to blind eyes, they would think, you know, why would I want to be a Christian? Why? I mean, they see Christianity as all these things that they're supposed to do and then all these other things that they're not supposed to do. And then it seems restrictive uh, to the, to the uh, human psyche or to the flesh or to the, the, the blinded eye. Uh, that would make sense. But if you actually read the Bible and understand what the Bible says, what you find is that the Bible asserts that the worship of God is the only path to freedom. That what we're learning all through Exodus as we're looking at these gospel shadows, a shadow of the gospel is really a shadow of this, the coming freedom. That's what the gospel is, the good news about salvation, which is freedom from the bondage of sin. And so all of these examples are just helping us see that really, if you're not worshiping God, you're anything but free. You're the furthest thing from, from free because you're in bondage to whatever it is you're worshiping, and everybody's worshiping something. And so, over and over, so God has really taught us this in about ten different ways. Every single week, it's been just sort of the same lessons, but in different ways. Because Why? Because... There's a multitude of different ways in which we will stray from the worship of God. So let's talk tonight about the function of the wilderness. The function of the wilderness. Over and over again, I'm hoping that through the course of this study, we'll stop resisting the wilderness. We'll stop resenting the wilderness. We'll stop... Um, you know, it, I'm not, I'm not going to say that, that the goal would be for you to like the wilderness because... You know, I think it just kind of, it, it comes with the wilderness that, I mean, I don't like the wilderness. But I don't want to resent the wilderness. I want to embrace it. I don't like it, but I want to embrace it. It's kind of like taking medicine. I don't like it, but I want to embrace it because I want to get better or having surgery or whatever the case may be. The wilderness, if, if, if God takes the wilderness out of your life, it is going to be a disaster. Now, we don't think that way, do we? But the Bible will tell you the worst thing that could ever happen to you would be for the wilderness to go out of your life altogether. Now, I don't want to stay in the wilderness all the time. I want to come up out of it for a while, but then I know I'm going back down in it. And then I'm going to come back up out of it, but then I'm going to go back. But I don't ever want it to go out. Think about it this way. Hell, hell is an eternity of God simply giving people what they wanted. That's all hell is. You don't want that. You do not want that. 
So although I don't want to be in the wilderness, I want to embrace it because I know I need the wilderness. And the wilderness is yet another reminder of God's presence in my life and His love for me. So I'm, I'm just trying to get us to reprogram our thinking. The wilderness, let's just get some definitions. It's the place between departure and arrival. That's what it is. The theological term for the wilderness could be sanctification. It's the place between justification and glorification. But basically, it's the, it's the in-between. Consider that we today live at a far, far, if I should have put far 87 times, greater moment in redemptive history than the Israelites did. I mean, every time we look at Exodus, if nothing else, we should walk away and think, God, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be born now as opposed to then. I would never uh, want to. I'm telling you that that there's, there's not going to be any tears in heaven and everything's going to be good, but I'm telling you there's probably going to be a little bit of jealousy because the Old Testament saints are going to be annoyed. I'm telling you, they're going to be going, you got to everything you had. If we'd have known that, oh, if we could have known what you knew. Oh, I mean, they could never in a million, especially these poor saps. I mean, this is the beginning. I mean, we're, we're, we're only in the second book. I mean, you know, we're in the third act here. They're, they don't know anything. They can't imagine in a million years what in the world is going to go on. So yet it's so much greater, but we are still in this gap between salvation come and salvation finished. So the Bible talks about our salvation always in past tense because it's past tense. In other words, we're, we're, our citizenship is already in heaven. There's already... Heaven exists as if we already... In other words, our place in heaven already exists. Put it that way. Our citizenship is already there. The moment we're saved, our citizenship is conveyed into the kingdom of light. But, so it's kind of like, you know, the house is there and all the, the, the movers have gotten there and they've unpacked all the stuff and everything's there and the power's turned on and it's all waiting for us. We just haven't got there yet. So we got to drive through the wilderness until we get there. But we need that. And it's all part of God's strategic plan. So in a nutshell, God's purpose for us in the wilderness is to increasingly live by faith. Which really is the whole reason why we're not in heaven right now is because God has a very crazy plan, which is that He's going to use people to accomplish His redemptive plan. And so, you know, I've said this a thousand times. I wouldn't have done it this way. To me, as soon as somebody got saved, they would have went to heaven. See, I would have bungled the whole thing up, which would have been a disaster. That wouldn't have worked, but that would make sense to me. You get saved, you go to heaven. You lost, you stay here. That makes sense. But you see, that, that wouldn't work because it would mess up the whole process of redemption because it would, it would muddy the waters of intention, wouldn't it? Right? Yes. I mean, come on, if, if, uh, if all you had to do was declare your love for something, you got a million dollars, then everyone in the world would declare their love for that thing, right? Of course they would. It would make it wrong. It would, it would mess up the intention of it. So God has this perfect plan where we get saved, but then we become his ambassadors, and we, so we still live in the wilderness, but we're growing, we're being sanctified day by day. Some, and so sometimes we're going down, well, you know, we're, we're going up the spiritual mountain, but sometimes you've got to go down before you can go up. And so we're on this journey going all over the place. And we're his ambassadors that perpetuate this redemption is going on, right? And so all this is happening. And so it's for us to be more and more faithful. That's his, that's his plan. Now, 
What we want is increasingly better circumstances. That's what we want. That's what I want. That's what I want. But what we need is increasing dependence on God. That's what God wants. So here is where the wilderness causes a problem. Is that God's intention in the wilderness and our desire in the wilderness clashes. So what we're about to read in a few minutes would be very easy for us to cast judgment against the children of Israel unless we understood that, that their desires and God's desires are clashing and it's recorded in Scripture to teach us that this is exactly the same identical thing that's happening to you and me. Some of us in this room right now we're in the midst of it right now. We're in the throes of it. So I want you to consider a few things. How could you know what patience is unless you were forced to wait? Have you ever thought about that? You would have no concept of patience had you not been forced to wait. Some of us in the room absolutely hate waiting because we are forced to do it. If we didn't have to do it, we wouldn't hate it. You wouldn't know what generosity is unless you had encountered need. You wouldn't have any context for generosity. You wouldn't have any, any scale or any realm in which you could understand it. You would have to encounter need to know what it is. Or what about mercy unless you'd encountered brokenness? You'd have to see brokenness to know what mercy is. Or how about this one? My favorite. How could you know what it is to submit unless God crosses your will? We should just stay here a minute. You could not know what it is to submit. You couldn't have a concept of what submission is. You, you, you and me would be utterly we would know, we would think submission would be to us like life on Mars. That's what it would be. But that God crosses our will. So you see, this whole idea, like I, like I talked about Sunday in Melissa's service, I think, I think that the, when you see someone who has joy in circumstances that you couldn't have joy in. The only explanation for that is that they understand something that most people don't understand. And that is that you cannot learn to submit unless God crosses your will. That The only way that happens is through the wilderness. It is the only way. What happens to... What happens to a child who grows up in an affluent family and gets everything they want, and so basically they're just a spoiled, rotten brat? Then what do they do when they don't get what they want? They throw a temper tantrum. They don't have any context for, I'm not getting this. Now, why do we all understand that? Why does that make perfect sense to us, and yet spiritually this principle just, we, don't, we just don't want to think about it? You know, we would never want, if we raised our children the way we want God to raise us, it would be a disaster, wouldn't it? See, I want God to raise me like Richie Rich. I don't know about you, but that's how I want Him to raise me. But it would be a disaster. That would be like a curse, but that's how I want Him to raise me. You see, so what, where did that come from? It's because that's God's way. That's why we know that things are right and we know that things are wrong. But we have to remember, they came from Him and therefore He applies that to us. So when He crosses your will, you're, you're either going to learn the beauty of submitting to Him or you're going to rebel against Him. Now when your child crosses your will, they're either going to submit to you or they're going to rebel against you. Now, if they choose to rebel against you, 
O Holy Mother and Father. What are you then going to do? You're going to turn the dial up on the flame, aren't you? Of course you are. Now what do you think God's going to do? Just let you go? No, Jonah. You're going to keep on until you wind up in the belly of a fish. That's what I mean, that's what we do. That's what God does. Where did that come from? It's for our good. So what is the this is the million dollar question. What is the benefit of the wilderness? In a word, exposure. The wilderness exposes us to what we need. The wilderness is school. The wilderness is, is where we learn, is where we're trained, is where we're equipped, is where... Sunday night in my uh, Dangerous Calling class, we were having this conversation. And I said, I was talking about how did you uh, notice that uh, when I, you know, because let's face it, you know how I am. I like to spring things on you. That's what I do. So it's just all part of the fun of being part of this family. So you come to church one Sunday morning and there's this thing in the bulletin and we're having these grow classes. And so there's a, and everybody's looking at these grow classes. Now there's a, there's a very strategic piece of information missing. And I know how you think and I know I know your how your brains are going around. I know what you're thinking. So you're looking at these classes and you're all thinking the same question. And right now you're going to deny it. You want to know who's teaching the class. And why do you want to know that? Because you're an immature control freak. That's why you want to know that. You want to know who's teaching the class. And you're going to make your decision on where you're going to go based on who's teaching the class. I know how you are. And guess what? It wasn't on there. And I told the staff, I said, shh. If anybody asks you, just say, I don't know. You have to ask Tony. And you're too chicken to ask me. So why? But I mean, think about this for a second. Because we've been talking about it every week in this study. Now, if I, if, if I want to, if you want to learn something about something, then who are you going to go talk to about it? Who are you going to, who, where is going to be your valuable resource? This is what I think most people would do. I think most people, if they wanted to know, if they were going to take a class, say, let's choose parenting, for example. You're going to take a class on parenting. Then what you're going to do is, you're going to seek out somebody who has fantastic kids, and then you're going to want to talk to them about parenting. Which is not a bad idea, but you're you're missing the point. I don't want to I don't want to talk to anybody about parenting who raised fantastic kids and never had any trouble. They can't help me. I want to talk to the person who went through the valley of the shadow of death. That's who I want to talk to and came up on the other side and their kids are still hanging on. That's who I want to talk to. That's who I want to talk to. And that's how, how I choose who I want to talk to about everything. I want to talk to somebody who has been pulverized about something. That's who I want to talk to. I mean, if you have a problem, you don't just want to talk to somebody who's read a bunch of books about it. You want to talk to somebody who's suffered you see, and so what we're learning here is remember a few weeks ago I talked about, you know, people who, who don't suffer are cold. They can't, they can't empathize. They're not caring. And listen, they lack wisdom. 
They spout off principles with no wisdom. I told my class, you know, I was, I said, you know, when I was thinking about, uh, well, first of all, the marriage class, I mean, you know, I made a joke about Joe and Stephanie teaching the marriage class. I'm still saying, God, how are they married still? You ever heard their testimony? I'm like, hey, that's who I want to ask about. How are you still married? The wilderness. I'm telling you, the wilderness. When you meet somebody and you're like, wow, they are just an amazing person. It's because what you're noticing is they have suffered. It's the wilderness. It's valuable. All right, look at verse 4. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which, are, which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. It sounds immature. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds so inappropriate. It sounds so... But you know, we do it all the time. Numbers 11, by the way, is where that text is. You can write that on top. We do it all the time. Where did the complaining start? Look very closely at verse 4. Who started complaining first? The mixed multitude. What does that mean? Who is the mixed multitude? It's all these, these uh, the, the Hebrew translation of that term would be riffraff. That's following along with the Israelites. So they start complaining. And then look, so then those who were among them, when they yielded to intense cravings, so the children of Israel also, see how that infiltrated in? So you start hanging around ungrateful, pagan, whiny, complaining people. And guess what happens? It infiltrates into you, right? Yes. And the next thing you know, you got problems. So the problem with the cravings, let's make it, make it sure that we're clear, is not desire. That is not the problem. The problem is not that they desire meat. That's not the problem. There's nothing wrong with desiring meat. Praise the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that their desire is misguided, misplaced, and out of control. That's the problem. It's the way that they respond to the desire that they have. It's the inappropriate way that they, they, they come before God. What if they would have came to God? What if they would have went to Moses and said, Moses, could you... Why don't you, would you go and ask God, just tell him, you know, if no is the answer, it's totally cool, but we would kind of like to, you know, we'd like to have a quail burger if that's okay. See if we could, you know, if, if that would fly, no pun intended, and we'd make it happen. They didn't do that. They threw a temper tantrum on the floor like a spore of rotten little brat. Instead of asking the question, do I like what I have better than what I used to have? Which is the question we ask all the time. So when we're in the wilderness, here's what we do. We're in the wilderness and we start, we start thinking about and fixating on when we weren't in the wilderness. And we start thinking about how good it was when we weren't in the wilderness compared to this place that we're in now. That's the wrong question. And as long as you're doing that, your focus is on the wrong thing, and you're always going to end up in the wrong, always going to get in the wrong place, always. What we should ask is the, the question, am I more dependent on God today than I used to be? Or ask the question, is God's presence in my life more evident today than it used to be? Because if you know, if all you know tonight, if you leave here tonight, the only thing you remember is, the wilderness is a place that's designed to deepen my faith so that I would increasingly have faith in God. If that's all you knew, 
then when you find yourself in the wilderness, and you will, and then you find yourself thinking about a time you were in the wilderness and reminiscing about that and lying to yourself about how wonderful that is, which it wasn't that wonderful. You just only remember the good things, the leeks and the garlic and the pomegranates and the cucumbers that you used to have back then. But if you don't do that and you say, but am I more dependent on God today? Is God more evident in my life than He was? And I guarantee you the answer will be either then or shortly after that, yes. Because that's what the wilderness does. That's what it does. I, I mean, just, just tonight before church, I was having a conversation with one of you about the most difficult thing that ever happened to you. That still, even though you're years on the other side of it, we're, we're talking about it, and you still tear up and choke up thinking about it. And then... You look at me and go, it was the best thing that ever happened to me spiritually. It's the wilderness. It's the wilderness. So five years from now, if five years from now, Justin's life is everything that he ever dreamt it would be. He's going to look back at three months of his life and he's going to say that was the best thing that ever happened to me. But in the middle of that, you think he was waking up in the morning going, this is the best thing that ever happened to me? I don't think he probably wasn't. What he was thinking was the best thing that would ever happen to me is if, and he's, you know, because that voice wants to just go, well, if you wouldn't have, wouldn't have, wouldn't have, wouldn't have, you wouldn't be. But that's not the point of the wilderness. The wilderness is not about all the yesterdays. The wilderness is about today and tomorrow. See, even in this, God's teaching us about condemnation. It's about tomorrow. So ultimately, the complaining that we're hearing is a rejection of God who desires to be the main course of their lives. That's what all this is about. The manna is simply, listen, God can make it rain anything He wants to. He, he's, he only gives a manna. Why? Because it's the wilderness and He's teaching them. It's all part of His plan. He knows they like me. He knows they, He could have started dropping 31 flavors of manna every single day and every day it was a different 31 flavors if He'd have wanted to. He didn't do that because He's teaching them. But they didn't see that. So then Moses goes into despair in verse 11, and he says to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found uh, favor in your sight? And you have laid the burden of all these people on me. Boy, if you read this whole passage, I mean, he gets downright, he is low. At one point he goes, why don't you just kill me? Now the last time we were here, Moses said, I'm not going unless you go with me, God. Now, <laughs> and God said, listen, I'm going to do everything you want for me. Right? God said, I'm going, to, I'm going to whip all your enemies. I'm going to provide everything you need. I'm going to stay here and you go. He said, I'm going to give you everything you want. You just go. And Moses said, nope, I'm not going unless you go. So then God goes. So God goes. And if God goes and what the Father goes, the Father goes, what then, then we're going to learn to be better because the Father doesn't leave us alone. He wants us to grow and be better. So the Father starts growing them. And then Moses is like, wait, wait a minute. What are you doing? You, why don't you just kill me? I have been there so many times. But what's key, the key I want you to get that Moses does is, because this is key for you, put an asterisk by this next one because this is where we're going to blow it. Moses doesn't address his burden by complaining to others. He goes straight to God. The temptation is so overwhelming to start whining to everybody else. But Moses goes straight to God. See, so often, if you'll just go straight to God, you'll, you will ultimately end up not whining to everybody else. Because you and God will sort it out. You'll, you'll go to God and then you'll remember and you'll go, oh, I know God, this is, this is about me having increasing faith in you. That's what this is all about. I remember that. So, you know, you're not going to go and start whining to your spouse 
or to your friends or to your co-workers or to whoever. So God responds to the people's sin. Boy, He brings lightning and wrath. And Verse 16, so the Lord says to Moses, okay, gather 70 men, gather the elders of Israel whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them and bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they will stand there with you and then I will come down and talk with you there and I will take of the spirit that is upon you and I will put the same upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. Then you shall say to the people, consecrate yourself some more and you shall eat meat for you have wept in the hearing of the Lord saying, who will give us meat to eat? See, God only reminds them of the nice things that they said. Not the, uh, Again, I wouldn't have done that. For it was well with us in Egypt, therefore the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. Verse 19, and you shall eat not only one day or two days or five days or ten days or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. That's lovely. Because you have despise the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we ever come out of Egypt? So God, no matter how that sounds to you, responds to them in grace. That is grace. Now when God says he's going to give it to you for a month all you want, that's grace. When God says it's going to come out of your nostrils, God's not, God's not saying I'm going to make it come out of your nostrils. He's just predicting what he knows in his, in his omniscience is going to happen. Because he knows them. See, if you're immature enough to, to get yourself into this mess, he knows what a bunch of them are going to do when they get in the middle of it. He already knows. And so that's what he's simply stating what's about to happen. So he graciously answers the complaints of Moses and the people by providing 70 elders. He solves Moses' problem. He says, here's 70 staff members to help you get the job done. And then on top of that, I'm going to give meat to the people. That's what they're whining about. So everybody gets what they wanted for Christmas. But again, he doesn't respond simply with provision. But it's instruction. God has a reason behind everything he does. It's not just random events. It's not just... Remember, we learned why the manna was the way it was. How come you couldn't gather more than what you needed for one day? How come only on the Sabbath you could gather extra the day before? All those things, they were all specifically designed. God was teaching them. And He's still teaching them. Just like He's teaching us today. He's still teaching us today. And wherever we are in our life, He's teaching us. In all these little things, we don't know. We just think it's another day. But He is in the midst of it teaching us. So one of God's great tools of instruction in the wilderness is to give us what we think that we need. See, sometimes what God does is He gives us what we think, what we're whining about. See, sometimes we do that as parents. We don't, you know, we don't tell people, you know. They're whining, 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 you know, because, you know, they see dad eating hot sauce. They want to have hot sauce. They want to finally go, go ahead. Here you go. And then you just sit back and go, let's see how this goes. Right? Yeah. I always remember uh, Colton would never stay away from the, the hot cooking sheet. I mean, never. He, he would just hover right up on it. She'd put, Lisa take the cookies out and put it on top of the... And he'd get right, you know, and she'd tell him, I mean, she'd get that wooden spoon out, he'd go to hopping. And uh, so, that I mean, that one day, he got up there to that cookie sheet, and I was sitting there watching him, and he, she told him, don't touch it. And he had his hands behind his back, and he stuck his lips out, and he put his lips on that cookie sheet. Kabam! Verse 25, then the Lord came down in a cloud. Now you've got to pay close attention here. And he spoke to him and he, took the, and he took of the spirit that was upon him and he placed the same spirit on the 70 elders as it happened when the spirit rested on them. They prophesied, although they never did so again. 
But two men had remained in the camp. Their name were, were their names were Eldad. Uh, one of them was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, but who had not gone out out to the tabernacle. Yet they prophesied in the camp. And the young men. So a young man ran to Moses and said, Eldad, Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of the choice men, answered him and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. And Moses said, Are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. So what in the world is up with Eldad and Medad? Why are we, what is the shadow here? There's a huge shadow cast right here. These two are prophesying. Now, there's a lot of significance about all these things that are going on all over this chapter that we haven't even addressed. But these 70 men get the spirit and they start to prophesy, but then they never do it again. But there's two guys that don't go out to the tent of meeting, but they're prophesying. And so then, you know, hey, that's not right. You shouldn't do that. And Moses is like, oh. Now, what did God promise Moses all the way back in the beginning? What did God say to Moses on Mount Sinai? He said, now, if you keep these commandments... Remember this conversation? You keep them. You don't have to keep them. You can stick your lips on the pan if you want to. You can do that. Or you can keep them. But if you do keep them, what's going to happen? I'm going to make you a special treasure. A what? Nation of priests. Remember that big promise? That was the big promise. Moses has never forgotten that. And so when he sees two people who have the Spirit, he thinks, wow, just think if everybody had it. Moses dreams of that day when the gifts and the responsibilities of the kingdom would spread across to everyone. Oh, I mean, he's grateful he has 70 elders to help him. But what if everyone had the Spirit? In other words, again, you know, I don't want to trade places with Moses for nothing in the world. On my worst day, when all I feel like I can do is herd cats, man, I'm trying to herd cats. You got the Holy Spirit. You've got an internal. You've got God inside of you, lead, guiding, and directing you. Moses has a bunch of empty ignoramuses. They got nothing. So he gets 70 to help him. He sees these two. It's just a little shadow. God uses Eldad and Medad to go, hey, remember? And everybody freaks out and panics. Eldad and Medad represent the power of God among the people and points us towards a day that is to come. Hmm. What day might that be? That's right. So on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit didn't come upon an elite few, but it came on everybody, didn't it? The fulfillment of that promise was Pentecost. Eldad and Medad were just a shadow of what was one day going to come. Now, tonight, I can stand here and we can have a conversation and look at all the Eldads and Medads in the room. Right? Yes. And you think now, now wait a second. Is God just that specific and strategic? Right down at the bottom of your paper, Joel chapter 2, verse 28. You know what Joel chapter 2, verse 28 says? It shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit, the Lord says, on everyone. Yeah, on my people. Yes. Now, do you think when the, when the, when the people 
heard Joel prophesy that, they're like, what you talking about, Willis? How in the world is that going to happen? What do you mean? And if anybody had the Spirit, they'd be running to somebody going, hey, they shouldn't be doing it. I mean, it freaked them out. And what do you think happened at Pentecost? All of a sudden, you know, people are like, whoa, what is happening now? Yeah. The paraclete, the helper has come. So the, the, there's so many shadows, it's unbelievable. When the, when the, uh, where did, the, where did the elders go to get the Spirit? Remember, he didn't just go, boom, the Spirit's on him. He said, nope, come up to the tent of meeting. Remember? So they come up to the tent of meeting. He puts the Spirit on them. Suffer Eldad and Medad. Then, if you go home and read this chapter, what does he tell them when he, when he gives them the quail? Does he say, okay, the, the quail's going to come. Just get ready. Uh-uh. He says, I want you to walk three days in that direction. And you get the quail. Now I want you to notice something. You don't think that means something? You want the Spirit, you go to the tent of meeting. You want the quail, you got to go outside the camp. The word Spirit in the Hebrew that God put on the elders is the exact same word God says, and then He blew the quail on the people. The word, He blew the quail. It's the exact same word as Spirit. The same word that came on the elders is the same word that brought the quail. And people ended up dying. Why did they die? Because they were gluttonous. And they were they were they were going crazy, and so all the people that were that went overboard. If you read the whole story, you know they ended up three feet deep in quail, three feet deep in quail, and so they're just going crazy and shoving it in their mouth, and, and then so a bunch of them died. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Where all the people died, the name of that place. The grave of craving is what it's called. All of these things mean something. They mean that God is the same God that, that is involved in these people's lives that we're reading about is the same God that's in your life except for this God here and this God here. This God's inside of us. And here... Only select people have it. So if he's in all the details on the outside, so, so whatever wilderness you're in tonight, whatever in the secrecy of your own heart, if, if I said just in your own heart, just answer the question, what is the one thing that I wish God would change right now about my circumstances? Whatever that is, because everybody's got something. I'm not saying that what you want is not a good thing. I'm sure it is. I'm not saying that what you want is, is something you shouldn't want. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm simply saying this. Instead of daydreaming about what it was like before that situation came into your life, why don't you ask yourself, am I more dependent on God today in the midst of that circumstance than I was before? And if the answer is yes, then why exactly is that a bad thing? If it's making you more dependent on God, it still, it still hurts, it's still painful, it's still, but you see how? Don't underestimate the sovereignty of God and His activity in the minuscule areas of our lives. The wilderness is something to be embraced. If you enjoy it, you need to be in a mental institution. But you need to embrace it. Embrace it. Not enjoy it. Embrace it. If you enjoy it, it's not the wilderness. But it's and God's using that. He's using that. And He's preparing you to use you through it. And so who are the most useful people in the kingdom? They're very easy to identify. They're the ones who have walked through the darkest 
wilderness. They're the most useful. Come on now. That's right. So when you want a counsel from somebody, what are you looking for? I know what I'm looking for. I want somebody who's been through war. That's what I want. Because they understand. They understand. They never prayed so hard that all it was was just blabbering and tears. Just wailing. Then I don't want to talk to them. It's the wilderness. He's using it in your life. Because he loves you. And he's good. He's good. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for instructing us yet again tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the shadow that just continually reveals your plan and the gospel to us, Lord. Thank you for helping us see tonight the blessing of being new covenant Christians, Lord. Thank you for the awesome power of the Holy Spirit and his presence in our life, God. Thank you for never leaving us and never forsaking us. Thank you that your proximity in our lives is not, is not dependent upon our recognition. And Lord, you have shown us every week in this study that when, when we feel furthest from you is usually when you're closest to us. And so thank you. I know there's some people in this room that I love so dearly and they hurt so bad right now. God, comfort them. Please comfort them as only you can. That you're using the wilderness in their life to mold and shape them, to, to make them more dependent on you so you can use them for greater things. Thank you, Lord. We love you tonight because you love us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you. Uh,